Carolina and State would call detectives Anthony English. Okay, we'll take a witness right here. We're going to stand when we get there. <coughs> you solemnly swear from the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. <coughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, detective. If you would introduce yourself to the jury and let them know how you are employed. Sure. My name is uh, Detective Corporal Samantha English, and I'm employed with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. And how long have you been employed at the St. John's County Sheriff's Office? For 11 years. And what are your current duties at the Sheriff's Office? I am uh, one of the two corporals in the Major Crimes Unit. Can you explain the uh, Major Crimes Unit, how it's set up? Like sure. We um, work in a team concept, so we have two sergeants, two corporals, eight detectives, and we're split into teams and we work in the with each other. And a prior, how long have you been in Major Crimes Unit? I've been in Major Crimes for almost four years. Prior to Major Crimes, do you have any other detective experience? Yes. I was a detective in property crimes in the Northwest District for a, about a year before Major Crimes. And your role in this case, uh, State of Florida versus James Colley, what would, how would you describe your role versus other detectives in your division? Sure, I was assigned as the lead investigator case agent. And how is that role different, if it is, from the other supporting detectives? So the case agent is responsible as a whole for the case, um, collecting everything uh, from beginning to end, pulling it all together, building a good case, and presenting it to the state and seeing it through prosecution. And you were working in this uh, capacity back on August 27, 2015? I was. And do you recall what day of the week that was? A Thursday. Did you get a call about Thursday morning to respond uh, in relation to a shooting? I did. And, you know, what, approximately what time and, and what happened after you received that call? Sure. So I was actually at a separate homicide scene. And it was about 10.45, and Lieutenant Cole contacted me and advised that we had a shooting in Mirabella and asked me to respond, so I did. And you responded pretty quickly there uh, thereafter? I did. I responded like some sirens. And um, what did you uh, see? Uh, where were, um, what were the activities that were going on at the house in Mirabella when you arrived? Sure, so there was a large number of patrol deputies there, obviously, um, and I arrived, I think, probably was the first detective to arrive on scene. I learned that there were two deceased females inside the home and that there was a uh, victim slash witness in an adjacent home. So I went over there and made contact with her. And who was that person? Rachel Hendricks. And um, after you gathered some information from Ms. Hendricks, what did you do with that information, specifically suspect information? Um, I informed everybody that was on scene what I knew, and we notified our dispatch center, um, who then started filtering it out to other deputies and local jurisdictions in the area to get a, a full well be on the lookout for uh, James Colley and his vehicle. And what information um, did you have a vehicle description at that time? that you thought it could potentially be? Sure, we had a vehicle description of a green Ford truck with a uh, duck head sticker on the back. Okay. And that information came um, from uh, which person? Rachel. Okay. It's a vehicle that she knew James Collie drove. Correct. And shortly after that, um, did you get uh, some support there at the scene on Bellagio? Yes, um, the rest of the unit arrived as well did uh, other detectives from other units came to assist district detectives and um, special victim detectives, they came to assist as well. Okay. And was it just that location on Bellagio or did a other location become important thereafter? Correct. So we learned that James was living with his sister Rhonda at 1189 Garrison Drive. So we filtered detectives to both locations <coughs> to assist. Okay. So kind of just tell the jurors how it works. Um, are you, are you conducting every interview? Um, what are the other detectives doing? And no, so um, I did conduct a few interviews. Um, I then talked with other detectives. We formulated a plan, and other detectives um, work in a support aspect. They conduct interviews, collect video evidence, um, do canvases, stuff like that. So I didn't conduct every interview. Other people on my team conducted them, too. How does that information make its way back to you? 
Um, there's two ways, really. We do a, a round table um, where we all sit together and brief everything that we've learned thus far. In this case, we couldn't round table because it was two separate scenes, so we uh, did it via phone. So you're constantly, fair to say, passing back information constantly uh, between the scenes. Did you actually, um, you mentioned Rachel Hendricks, did you conduct any other interviews there in that Bellagio area? I did. I talked to Mike Dickens and uh, Chris Dobbins. Chris Dobbins wasn't in an interview. I just informed him that Lindy had been killed. And uh, Wilmar Dubberly was in that area. Did you do his interview or someone else? I did not. Detective DeLeo did. And um, did you learn that there were several members uh, of the defendant's family at a particular location uh, that day? Yes. Um, so I learned that his, James's uncle, father, sister, and I believe brother-in-law were, correction, brother-in-law wasn't there, were at 1189 Garrison. I then learned his mother and the brother-in-law were at the nearby Publix, um, close to Mirabella. And those persons were interviewed by other members supporting you? Correct. Um, did you come to learn about mm -hmm. a, a particular person, a girlfriend that the defendant had um, on that day? Yes, Amy Mason. And was she interviewed by you or someone else? Somebody else. Was James Colley located in St. John's County immediately after the homicide? He was not. Um, you know, were looking for him, though, is that correct? Yes, so we issued a bullet for him, him and his truck, and people were actively looking as well as helicopter. So you kind of described, like, it's a dynamic scene with many people involved. Sure. After that initial information is coming back to you, at some point during that day on the 27th, do you um, and other members of your unit move to um, get warrants and things? Yes. So I drafted a arrest warrant for James for um, two counts of first degree premeditated murder. And um, now Sergeant, but I think then he was a corporal, Eugene Tolbert, drafted uh, two search warrants for one for Bellagio and one for Garrison. And approximately what time were those uh, warrants obtained? About 1 o'clock, 1.30. Okay. When an arrest warrant is obtained uh, by someone in your agency, what happens with that information? How does that information get out to law enforcement? Sure. So we turn it into our warrant section, but then we also turn it into our teletype in our com communication center. And they enter it into a mm -hmm. law enforcement database called NCIC and SCIC, which um, goes out to all the law enforcement agencies in the area in the event that somebody comes across James walking down the street, or any suspect for that matter, walking down the street, or they run a tag, it'll populate on the screen that they have a warrant and to detain them. Okay. So, and you mentioned some databases, NCIC and FCIC. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's one of those at National as well. Correct, NCIC. And so, when we hear, um, you know, on TV and stuff, pulled over and some uh, law enforcement officers running your license or running your tag. Is that what you're referring to? Correct. Okay. So they're running that information in a database to see if anyone has warrants. Correct. To check for warrants. Were you um, present on the uh, day that uh, on the 27th when the Bellagio was um, being processed by crime scene technician Bulmer? I was. Okay. Did that uh, process conclude on the 27th? It did not. Uh, while you were a part of that process into the later evening hours, did there come a time where you learned um, that James Colley had been arrested? I did. And um, <coughs> possibly what time and uh, what was his location when he was arrested? So I learned it was about 10 p.m. that he had been stopped in a car in Norton, Virginia um, and was subsequently arrested. And what did you do and others in response to getting that information? Immediately left and drove to uh, Norton, Virginia. Okay. And who, who went? Myself, then, now Sergeant Tolbert, and Sergeant Russ Martin. And um, when you're gone up there, are you communicating with law enforcement officers in that county area? Yes. So I made contact with the officers that stopped him, as well as the Wise County Sheriff's Office, asked that they secure the vehicle, um, and start working on a warrant to obtain his DNA, um, his clothing, um, and to process the vehicle. And uh, so you left late that night, it sounds like? Yes. Okay. Uh, drive through the, the night? night? Correct. And we arrived, we left, well, we learned at 10, so we left shortly after. We arrived at about 9 the next morning, 
and went straight to the sheriff's office and started working on things. And were you present uh, for the search of a vehicle there in uh, Virginia? I was present for it. And the law enforcement officers in Virginia actually conducted the search, is that correct? That's correct, the uh, Virginia State Police. Okay. And what vehicle was it that you found when you got to Virginia? It was a maroon Infinity. And you know the owner of that Infinity? Rhonda Colley. Um, all of the evidence that you discussed, the car, clothes, things like that, um, DNA, um, was that transported back with you and the other members of the St. John's County Sheriff's Office? Yes. Um, initially, that, that evening, we had driven through the night, so we were obviously exhausted, so we stayed that evening. While we were there, it was submitted into Wise County Sheriff's Office evidence room, so it was secure, and then the next morning, we picked it up and drove it back here straight away. And... Um, Part of some of that evidence was property that was received off of um, Mr. Colley's person uh, when he was arrested, is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> Your Honor, may I approach, please? You bet. All right. Detective, I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as states SS. If you would just take a look at this sure. exhibit, let me know if you recognize it. I do. And um, understanding, you, know, you weren't the person that collected this, but as part of your case, um, you were present and you've since reviewed this evidence, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, what is um, some of the evidence that you identify on? Sure, so there's three receipts. The first one is a receipt for the Eastwood Discount Market in uh, Hilliard, Florida. And the next one is a receipt for the Speedway on 150 Hampton Point Drive for a Corona and some Marlboros. And the third is a receipt for the same Speedway at 150 Hampton Point, which happens to be in the front of the neighborhood to Mer uh, Southampton. And it is for cigarettes and a Gatorade. And then the last piece is some broken glass. And um, are there times indicated on the two speedway receipts? Yes. So one of the, the first time for the corona and the cigarettes is 10, 14, 18 hours. And the second one is 10, 10 o'clock at 18 um, seconds. And August 27th. Correct. This speedway, um, after you learned this information, did you look into uh, the location, I believe you mentioned it, but the location of that speedway. Yes, it's at the very beginning of the Southampton neighborhood. Okay. I'm kind of a right. Um Prior um, to court, do you recall making a presentation of maps uh, for court here today? I do. Right. Right, may I approach? Sure. Corporal, I'm sorry, Corporal English. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as states BBB1 and 2. Uh, can you take a look at those exhibits and let me know if you recognize them? Yes, this is this of the PowerPoint that I initialed and signed. And that's a printed out. And this is printed out maps, correct. And after reviewing those maps, they're um, accurate maps of the locations we're going to be discussing uh, to the best of your knowledge, correct? Yes. Now at this time, state would move in states BBB1 and 2 and permission to publish the Okay, proceed as the state's next number positive exhibit is 38. Yes. State's 38. Okay. Detective, if you could take a minute and, uh, and you can step down and use the pointer and sure. uh, show us what we're looking at here. So this is 1189 Garrison Drive, um, which would be around this house for Dane Twins Living. This is County Road 210, although it says Old, Old Palm Valley Road, it's really 210. Um, and then this is the store right here. Okay. So that's the speedway um, that the receipts came from at both 10 a.m. and then another one at 10.14 a.m. Correct. Okay. Here's a, a close-up, I believe, describe that, what we're seeing here. So this is County Road 210, and this is the store. This, this is the gas pumps. There's an awning of the gas pumps. That's not another building. That is the gas pumps. And then this is the actual store. This is the main entrance to the neighborhood, and this is Garrison Drive. Okay. Can, are you familiar with that area? I am. Can you get from the gas station into Southampton without going back to 210? 
Yes, you can. Okay. So if you were to take Garrison Drive to Southampton Parkway and make a right right here on Hampton Point, um, there's a little driveway right here that leads right into the store. Okay. Corporal well, English, during your investigation, uh, were you able to identify the owner of the 9mm handgun that you've seen in evidence in this case? I was Amanda's father, James Cloninger. And what about the 45 caliber? James Colley. Detective English, um, throughout your investigation, did you uh, attain, obtain, uh, with legal process, uh, phone records of um, James Colley in this case? I did. Okay. And when we say phone records, we obviously heard some phone testimony earlier. Sure. How is what we're talking about different than what we heard earlier? Sure. So the information that you heard earlier was um, about the actual device. I drafted a court order for phone records from AT&T, who is his provider, um, and requested certain information, call detail records, location data, stuff like that. And what was the purpose in obtaining that information? To get his locations. Okay. Is that something that you would do yourself, or do you have another resource for that? Sure. No, that is not something I would do myself. So after we receive the records back, we then send them to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, and they have analysts who are experts in mapping. Um, locations from the phone records. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I think with, uh, I believe without objection from the defense, state would offer states JJ. It is um, uh, AT&T records, a subset of those with attached um, business certification. Is that correct, Mr. Yes, sir. Objection. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Without objection, we received a state's exhibit 39. And Corporal English, when you obtained those records, were they um, voluminous? <laughs> they were. It was almost 900 pages. Okay. And um, for court purposes today, um, you can re review again States 39. Sure. But the time period and, and what are we entering here in evidence today? So this is obviously not 900 pages. This is um, page 124 to page 143. And it is just the dates of August 25th <coughs> till August 28th. So just a small portion. Okay. And obviously the, this is what you submitted and asked FDLE to map, um, focusing on the locations of him the night before and going into the day of the homicide? Correct. I wanted to ask you a few questions um, related to some people who have been identified. Uh, and we've heard their names throughout some of the testimony. Sure. Um, through your uh, investigation in the case, who um, was identified in Amanda's phone uh, as a contact with Lacey Dubs? Lamar Dumberly. And we heard earlier about a contact, Nick Manet. Who's that? A coworker, I believe, her boss, Amanda's boss. And at the same time, we were talking about some contacts early morning before the homicide, there was a Tommy Roberson. Who is that to her? That's going to be her stepfather. Okay. Thank you. Detective English, um, in your investigation, were you able to uh, locate surveillance video um, on the old South Bellagio street in this case? I was. Um, I located it at 229 South Bellagio. And um, I'm going to switch here to this map. So this is, um, if you'll describe, yeah, describe what we're seeing. Here. Correction. So this is Amanda's home. This is Mike Dickens' home. And this is 225 where I uh, collected the video from. Okay. And um, when you tell us about that, um, go into that house. Um, what cameras you saw and what did you collect? Sure. So there was two cameras on the home. Um, I don't want to break the screen. It's okay. There was one on this eve and one on this eve. And the one on the left eve pointed out towards the entrance to the neighborhood. And the one on the right eve pointed directly down to the cul-de-sac. Okay. And when you went to that house and uh, viewed the surveillance, uh, what is something you do to, to check uh, to see if that system is keeping our correct date and time. Sure. So I uh, compare the video time because oftentimes people 
don't sync their video with the correct time. So I checked that against uh, UTC time. So you, exactly um, what did you do? Correct. So I took my cell phone, which automatically calculates the time, and I took another cell phone and took a picture of my cell phone in front of the timestamp on the camera and submitted that into evidence. And was the uh, time and date on the video system operating at 225 South Bellagio correct when you, um, when you checked it? It was. Okay. Do you remember the day in which you collected this evidence? I believe, may I reflect my notes, but I believe it was on the 29th. May I check? Okay, you can check. Thank you. Stand corrected. It was August 30th. Okay. August 30th. And um, prior to court, um, did we uh, prepare uh, certain uh, clips that were relevant to um, the investigation? We did. Okay. You collected obviously a larger time period. Is that correct? I did. I collected um, that whole night and part of the evening before. Okay. And um, may I approach Judge? I don't believe there's any objection to admitting this. No, you're not. Okay. Um, and without objection, um, the thumb drive, uh, what did we place on the thumb drive prior to court? The clips. That we're going to be discussing here today? Yes. <coughs> Just want to make sure it has my initials. Yeah. It does. Yes. Here at this time, statement move in states II and permission to publish. That's going to be received in evidence that states that the four you need to publish. And before we start showing the clips, um, what, just so they have an uh, orientation sure. using this map before we start, um, what's going to be the vantage point, so to speak? So the vantage point that you're going to see is going to be from the right eave looking down to the cul-de-sac. start with you on the early morning hours of the 26th, um, the 440 time in the morning, okay? Right? And I'm going to start with uh, clip one and ask you, let me get it started here. So as you can see, it's 441 and there's a truck that um, looks to be a dark colored Ford pulling down Bellagio towards, towards the cul-de-sac and eventually pulls into Mike Bacon's driveway. Lights go off and then you'll, I don't know if this clip ends before it happens. Then we pick up with clip two. So the What's, uh, for the record, Corporal English was the start time of clip two approximately. It is 4218. Okay. So the lights come on, which typically indicates the door has been opened. And this is if it's hard to see, somebody walked right there. You can see them walking um, in front of the, the truck towards the home. You can see this clip is approximately four minutes long, um, we'll sit here and watch it, Corporal. Yeah, so the lights go out on the truck, um, I think they just come out. Um, may I move back so I can see? Yeah. Somebody's walking to the side of the truck and opens the door. There's another person that's now exiting and walking towards the truck. on the passenger side of the truck at this point. While we're kind of watching it here, um, you see the use of the truck is located at uh, Mike Dickens' house. Correct. Um, you see that house kind of right at the end of the screen with the lit up driveway? Uh, yes. Where is 260 Bellagio in relation to that house? Right behind these trees, bushes, underneath this light. You can't really see it well. Just around the way right next door okay. of the cold side. Yes. <coughs> the lights go on. 
probably see something um, that you want to note if you just notate the time. Okay. Um, so we're Watching this, approximately what time, if you have to look at your notes, does the truck uh, end up leaving the driveway? It's approximately four or five minutes later after it, ar it arrives. Um, 4.41 it arrives. And 4.46, 17. Okay. Lights come on, 4.45 to 6. Come on, 445-47. Somebody's walking back towards the home, 445-53. starts to reverse at 446.16. surveillance um, video, uh, were you able to, to then look to the next uh, morning, uh, and what were you looking for uh, <coughs> the next morning leading up to the homicide? Correct. So I was trying to timeline people when they arrived at the scene at the residence um, and just sort of get a general timeline that we knew was factual based on this. And for the record, I'm going to publish clip four, and I'll ask you. Sure, so that is um, 9, 10, 50 hours, and that is Amanda arriving at the residence in her white SUV. Just so the jurors can see it back up. And so at the beginning, you see this white SUV, and that is Amanda's car. Which is the same one that was in the residence. That's correct.
put seven. I'll ask you about this when it comes up. And Your Honor, with uh, stipulation and agreement with the uh, defense, I'm, this is a longer clip. I'm going to fast forward to the relevant portion. Well, let me ask you when, you, when you looked into the uh, video system there at the house, what triggers the system to work? Motion. Okay. And so here you see across the street again, mm -hmm. uh, the arm. Yeah, the chair. Well, he wasn't blowing it right there. Mm -hmm. He wasn't there. more running from the residents across the cul-de-sac and through uh, some residents. What time? Between two residents. What was it approximately time? 10 30 you know, I'm sorry. No, you're fine. I can reflect, reflect back to my notes if I'm allowing. <coughs> Shortly after 10. 10 36 11.
Purchases beer and gas. 1013. Correct, which would essentially be your 1014 10, receipt. 1014 receipt. Correct. I, I didn't see that on there. Right. He, it's not on there. And he only purchased, what was it, 2.76 gallons of gas, I think it was? I don't recall. Do you have that in your notes? I do. Might. Do you mind if I take Please a minute? Do. Two point seven six five gallons of gas. Two point seven six five. Correct. That's not pretty much gas, is it? It's subjective. I guess it depends on what you're putting it in. <laughs> or how far you're going. True. Um, also, as far as the phone calls you were in here for Detective Causey's, and I'm sure you have it. Uh, Amanda had called Jr. at eight fifty eight that morning. and believe that's correct. May I reflect my timeline? Yes. 8.58, Amanda called James, and his call lasted for approximately six minutes. And uh, I believe Amanda was coming from the RV park on 16 and 95? Presumably, yes. Based on Lamar's testimony? Correct. So she would have been in the car during that time, roughly? Correct. Okay. And then uh, JR called Amanda at 9.41, and they talked for approximately 14 minutes? Correct. Right, so they would have been on the phone? when Lamar arrived at 9.42. Let me look back at the video. Yeah, the the recording, yeah. I think the video showed 9.42.45. 9.42, correct. Okay. And then the PSA officer arrived, and I think it was 9.55.51? PSA arrived at 9.55.50. 50, okay. So uh, the roughly 14 minutes, uh, she would have still been on the phone close to when the PSA officer arrived? Probably close to it, yes, sir. Or hung up right, right around that same time? Correct. Okay. Nothing else, Sean? Yeah, we Briefly, um, pull around the videos. During that time frame, when you were timelining out everyone's arrival, um, you did not locate a uh, defendant traveling down South Bellagio. Objection the in the scope of cross. I'll sustain that objection. Uh, no further questions. Uh, Any regard? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Stay with the lawyer next week. Stay with the lawyer next week. State calls um, Mike Pickens. Mr. Pickens, if you come on right up here to the witness stand. If you were in the you can get there. Are you going to get your phone Can you solemnly swear upon the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? That's good. Take a seat, sir. Mr. Johnson, you may inquire. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Could you introduce yourself to the jury? My name is Mike Dickens. And how are you doing, sir? I'm sorry? How are you employed? Full uh, time. By who? What do you do, sir? Uh, I'm in the construction, construction industry. And where do you live? I live in 249 South Bellagio. How long have you lived um, at that uh, address? 2011. And um, do you know, sir, an individual by the name of Amanda Colley? Yes, I do. And how do you know her? Um, just mutual friends. All right. From um, I'm sorry? Mutual friends from when we moved to Mendel House together. 
Do you know an individual by the name of James Coffey? I do. And uh, she was, uh, he was Amanda's husband, is that correct? Yes. And did you meet both James and Amanda Colley roughly the same time? Yes. How would you describe um, your relationship um, with um, James Colley, the defendant in this case? Um, to me, I'd say probably pretty much close to best friends. Now, you said that um, you and his family um, um, could sort of describe to me how you got, how, how you met them again. I just one of the first couple of houses in the cold sack, and you know, neighbors. Then grew up, you know, grew up rapport with them. Kids grew up together. Kids were the same age. Our kids and their kids. Who who moved into the neighborhood on Bellagio Drive first? They did. They did. Okay. But between us two. Yes. Sir. Yes, they did first. All right. And do you know how long approximately they lived there before you been? A couple months, sir. And um, initially, um, did um, James and Amanda Collier live um, at 260 South Bellagio together? Yes. Mr. Dickens, I am showing you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit MM1, which is a, a CD, as well as MM2, which is a printout of the items on that CD. Do you recognize it, sir? I do. And uh, uh, how do you recognize it? Um, I believe it was a couple weeks ago. Okay. I went into your office. And you reviewed um, some photographs that are on the CD? Yeah, the photographs that you showed me that day, yes, sir. Okay. And after you reviewed it, um, you signed it and dated it, is that correct? I made a copy, yes, sir. And um, is that located on this disc here? My, my your signature? Yes, yeah, at the bottom. That's probably it. And after you had a chance to review those photographs, were um, those photographs um, a fair and accurate um, depiction of the, a map of the neighborhood as well as some other photographs as well? That's correct. Your Honor, this time I'd offer State's Exhibit MM1 and MM2 into evidence. Any objection? No objection. No objection. No objection. No objection. No objection. You see the State's composite Exhibit 41. And I'll publish mm -hmm. the Exhibit, Your Honor. You may. <coughs> Mr. Dickens, I want to take you to uh, photograph A that was on that um, disc. Um, this is a, a map of the neighborhood, is that correct? Yes, sir. And does this accurately depict um, uh, the residence where um, Amanda Colley and James Colley initially um, live in reference to yours? That's correct. In terms of your um, relationship um, with the defendant in this case, um, how often did you did you talk with him? Quite often. Every day? Pretty much. I would think so. Yes, sir. Um, did, you, did you hang out together? Do they do? Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of, how often would you uh, hang out with them? Uh, probably several times a week, not a thing, yes sir. Okay, what kind of things would you do together? Um, play poker, go to poker, poker room, go to bars, play pool. <laughs> did you? Uh, races. Um, did you talk to him on the phone? Yes. No, 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 not often though, but I did. All right. What um, was your cell phone number back then? 904-349-3635. And how long did you have that cell phone number? Uh, since long as I can remember being in Florida. Do you have that same phone number today? Yes. And did you talk to James Colley on that phone? I have, yes. Do you recall what his cell phone number was back then? Um, do you still have it on your phone today? Uh, I said yes, sir. Okay. Can you uh, take your phone now and yes, sir. look at it and tell us? Thank you. 
four four nine five zero one zero seven is what I have programmed in there. Okay. Now, when you and I talked a few weeks ago, you advised that uh, his phone number was nine zero four three one five one zero nine six. Is that correct? I don't know, well, sir. Can you give me that number again, sir? 904-315-1096. Okay, I do have that number. Yes, sir. Under James C. Okay. Yes, sir. And that was the number you, you would talk to him on occasion, is that correct? I would, I would think so, yes, sir. I can recall that number. On average, how often would you talk to um, James Colley on the phone? Either, either uh, by voice or by text? I mean, probably not often. I mean, we lived right beside each other, so it was more when we saw each other, but it was occasionally. Okay, would you text him um, once a week, twice a week, ten times a week? I would say less than ten times, I'm sure. I can't give you a for sure number, sure. Right. Um, did there come a time, Mr. Dickens, when, um, and, I, and I don't want to go through all the details of it, but would there become a time when you became aware that there were some um, marital problems between um, James and Amanda Collie. Yes, sir. And at some point, you become aware that um, James Collie had moved out of the residence there at 260 South Bellagio. That is correct. Now, do you recall when you became aware of that? I don't. No, sir. Uh, was it um, uh, shortly before the events that we're here to talk about today? I would think so. It was from what I recall with the app of July 4th. Okay. Did you have any contact with, um, uh, before I ask you the question, do you see the person in the courtroom today, James Colley, that we're referring to? Yes, sir. Can you point to him and describe the article of clothing he's wearing? Red tie, blue, blue uh, suit. Okay, sitting over here at this table? Yes, sir. And the record reflected the witness has identified the defendant? Uh, did you have any uh, contact um, with the defendant on um, August the 27th of 2015? Is that the day of the incident? Uh, yes, sir. In the early morning hours, sir. Now, at that particular point in time, you didn't get you aware that he was, he is, was not living in the residence there on South Bellagio. Did you know where he was living at the time? Um, with the sister, yes, sir. And, and what is the sister's name? Rhonda. Do you know where her, that house is located? It was in Southampton. Were you aware that um, he had an injunction that prevented him from being within 500 feet of the residence on South Bellagio? I was. Now, approximately what time was it that you had contact with the defendant on August the 27th of 2015? Probably shortly around 4 a.m. How did you have first contact with him? Was it by phone? Was it by yeah, he was calling, I can't recall totally, but he was either was either calling me or I know I finally answered the door. He was knocking on the door in the garage. What were you doing at the time? Sleeping. Did you get up and answer the door? I did. What did he uh, say to you when you did so? Uh, he just wanted me to come outside and look in the front seat of his truck. All right. Did he tell you why he wanted you to look in the front seat of his truck? Not at the beginning. He just kept telling me to, to get out there and look, look, look what I did or look what I found. Okay. How would you describe his um, demeanor at the time? Um, He was agitated. He was he was upset. And he was uh, real antsy, but he was upset. He was crying from what I recall. He was upset. He said, "Yes, sir." Um, did you ever go and um, go outside of the driveway where he was? I finally did. Yes, sir. Did the, most of your conversation um, occur in the driveway there? Your house? Most of the conversation occurred in the, right outside the front door. And did you uh, go and see what it is he wanted you to see? I did. I did. I think I walked partly to the truck, but I did not, from what I call, I didn't go and look in the truck itself. That I can remember. Okay. Um, what, what vehicle was he there in? He was in his screen Ford F-150. And um, 
Did he show you what it was that he did? Yes, sir. And what, what was it that he wanted you to see? A bunch of uh, sex toys. And he was upset about uh, was. discovering these items. Is that correct? It was, yes, sir. Did he tell you where he found these uh, toys? He did. Where did he tell you he found them? He told me he had ransacked the house and he found this inside the house. And when you say ransacked the house, or it was he referring to uh, Amanda Colley's residence at 360 South Bellagio? He was, yes, referring to his house, yes. How did you um, respond uh, to that? Basically that, well, there's your proof, you know, that we're, she's cheating and we're, my conversation basically was big deal, you know, big deal, who cares, go home, you know. So up to this point, you were, you were generally aware of the problems that they've been in the back and forth and things of that nature, is that right? To some extent, right. And I didn't know all the details, no, no, but you knew that there were some problems that had been going on for a while. And um, he shows you these um, toys, and your response to him was a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I recall, yes, sir. Um, but his response to you, his demeanor, was that this was a big deal to him, correct? No, I don't think I ever stated that. I, I, I didn't say you did, I was just asking you. Yeah, it, did it appear it was a big deal to him? I he did. I just kept going on, this is what I found, this is what I found. I'm like, you know, I just, from what I recall, I just kept telling them, big, big F deal, you know. Okay. What did you, um, tell me, what did you, how did your conversation proceed from that point? I told them that we were, you know, I said, you need to chill out, you need to go home, you know, get through, just get through this divorce. Told them, either I told them to go get a beer out of my garage, or, I think I got over the garage or I gave my beer, told him to go home, go to sleep. I want to take you to photograph B um, here. Um, are these the items that he showed you that night? From what I, what I recall, yes, sir. Did he also show you some other items other than other than these, these toys? The only thing I, 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 barely, I barely, barely recall would be um, some clothing. I think it was some boxers or something. Okay. Did um, did he seem to be more upset about one type of item than another? I wouldn't think so. No. You recall um, giving a, a deposition in this case, Mr. Dickinson? Yes. Okay. Uh, on February the first of 2016, is that correct? Does that sound correct? I mean, I recall going to. Court or the court court office on what day it was. And this was a deposition that was um, that Mr. Shoemaker here, he was at that deposition, is that right? Yes, sir. And Ms. Dunn, he or she was at that deposition, that correct? Right? Yes, sir. Um, and at the beginning of that deposition, you took an oath to tell the truth just like you did today, is that correct? I did. And if there's any, um, may I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. And for counsel, I'm going to refer to page 21, uh, lines 18 and 19. Okay. And I want to be fair to you, Mr. Dickens. I'm going to show you the deposition and just see if that refreshes your recollection. Page 21 here, so page 18 and 19, if you can read that sentence there. Which one? The second one. Don't read it out loud, just take a look at oh, it. Okay. Okay, I don't recall that statement. You don't recall making the statement that you saw the, the straps and the dildo or oh, whatever yeah, going into this one right here. Okay, just take a look at that whole paragraph. Yes, yeah, I recall the first part of it and I recall the second part of that. Okay. The second sentence. You don't recall saying that, I mean, I think um, that these items, the straps and dildo, made him more upset than the clothes did? Oh, I'm reading it wrong. Yes, sir. You do remember yes, that? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I read it wrong. I apologize. So um, now you've had your uh, recollection refreshed. Um, the, the, these toys here um, did make him more upset than the clothes. Is that correct? Uh, apparently, I get. I mean, I, I remember making reference to clothes and, and what I saw in the toys. I mean, as I said, he was upset about the toys. That's what you said at your deposition, correct? 
Yeah, I, to what to what the paper says, I, I don't recall word for word. No, sir. Okay, and that was closer in time to when these events occurred than today. Is that right? Oh, definitely. Did, um, did the defendant tell you, other than finding these items, finding the clothes, um, did he tell you what else he did while he was in Amanda Colley's home? Yes. What else did he tell you that he did? He just told me to ransack the house and busted TVs. What was your response to that? Um, from what I call, I told him he was stupid. <laughs> that was Why stupid. was that? Because he get himself in trouble. He wasn't supposed to be around the house. Did at any point in time during this conversation you ever invite him inside your home? I did not. Did he ever say that um, he wanted to come inside? No, sir. Now, um, at this particular point in time, did it look like he had been drinking or anything like that? Not that I recall. I did not recall. I mean, I usually knew when he was drinking. All right. Did, uh, you had indicated earlier something about some beer. I, I told you that I would. I told him either I told him to get one beer or I give him a beer or give him two beer, whatever. I said, take these and go home and go to sleep. Okay. That you was made the last conversation. So he uh, grabbed a couple of beers from one or two, I don't recall, but and left. Um, so how long did um, was the defendant at your at your house? Less than 30 minutes. And did he eventually leave? He did. Uh, did you talk with him again after that? I didn't. Um, not verbally, no, sir. Did you communicate with him? Maybe not verbally, but did you communicate with him in any other way after that? Um, I texted him. Right. Why was that? Uh, probably, I don't know, it was an hour or so after, maybe. I told him, as I woke back up, I told him it was stupid. And, now he's going to ruin his life and stuff like that, you know. He was going through a divorce and, you know. Did you, did you text him about, um, you know, the fact that he had ransacked the house and left sort of evidence behind that he had been there? Did you text him about that? I think I told him, if I recall, that he needs to clean his mess up. But now he's going to go to jail, you know. So at some point like that. Did you have to work that day? Yes, sir. And do you recall um, what time you uh, left for work that morning? Yeah, somewhere between 7 and 7.30, I think. Uh, when you left um, your um, house, your your house is within eyesight of Amanda Colley's residence, correct? Right? Yes, sir. When you left that morning, did you see any vehicles in the driveway? I did not. Did you send any other, um, other than the text that you sent to him um, telling him he, should, he needed to clean up his mess, um, did you send him any other text that morning? Um, and, and this was probably been before um, you went to work. Do you recall that, anything like that? No, I don't. So. Uh, after you went to work, did you learn of the shooting that occurred at Amanda Colley's home? I did. Yes. And where were you at the time? In my office. And how did you find out about it? Um, I don't know. I can't remember. It was my son or my father-in-law called. Or my wife. I can't remember. Someone called me. One of my family members called me. Okay. Your father-in-law. Where was he at at the time? He should have been at my house. <coughs> what was he doing there? Um, he takes care of my youngest daughter. Takes her to school, camp, whatever. When you received the information that there had been the shooting at Amanda Colley's home, what did you do? Um, jumped in the truck and, and headed to the house. When you arrived at the house, um, you learned in more detail um, what had occurred there. I don't recall. I was in a blackout mode after I got that call, so I was just high tailing all the way through there and 
down the street. Did at some point you learn that the defendant was responsible for what occurred at the end of Colley's home? Um, I'm sure, yes, sir. After that, did you um, text um, the defendant um, any text messages? I did. I don't remember what time it was that morning. I think it was later that morning. But I was trying to figure out where he was when I, you know, when I was trying to go to the house. Okay. Um, did you uh, tell, text him to tell him he needed to turn himself in? I, yes, I think that's what I did tell him. Among some other things? Uh, plenty of things, yes, sir. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit. I want to kind of go backwards a little bit in time. Um, with regard to the marital problems that um, Amanda Colley and, and James Colley were having at the time, um, prior to all of the shooting and all of this that occurred, um, did, Jane, did the defendant in this particular case uh, tell you that he suspected Amanda Colley of having a relationship with another individual? He did. And did you ever, um, at, after the defendant had um, left the residence, after he had moved out, moved in with his sister Rhonda, did you ever see um, a, a man at Amanda uh, Colley's residence? One time. And do you recall when that was? I do not. Uh, what was the guy doing when you saw him? It was cutting grass. Mm -hmm. And what did you do when you saw him? You know, when you say cutting grass, what part of the, the property was he cutting grass? Front yard. What did you do when you saw um, him cutting grass in the front yard? I took a picture. I'll show you um, photo C here. Um, is this the photograph that you took of the, of the man? Yes, sir. What did you do with that um, photograph after you took it? I sent it to his sister, Rhonda, for verification of who that guy was. Now, during this period of time, I'm talking about in the sort of weeks and days leading up to um, the shooting, um, did the defendant ever ask you um, to, um, to look and see if there were um, uh, Amanda's a vehicle or anyone else's vehicles were parked in the parking in the driveway or near her house? I think I vaguely remember a couple of texts if there was anybody in the driveway, any cars. Do you remember um, on July the 13th um, him sending you a text asking you if Amanda stayed at the house last night? Um, vaguely, yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember on July the 25th at 10.23 p.m. him texting you asking if Amanda's truck was uh, was a man's truck here this a.m., meaning this morning? Um, vaguely, sir. Okay. Do you remember him texting you at 8.24 p.m. on July the 26th and asking, um, was there a car there? Vaguely, I don't, I don't recall those conversations or those texts. Do you recall on July the 25th, 2015 at 7 a.m. him texting you asking, is her car there? I don't remember those texts. Um, during your contact um, with the defendant, your, your, close, your close friend, your best friend, um, was, um, did the defendant ever blame anyone in particular for causing or, I guess, helping to cause um, um, his uh, marital problems with his wife, Amanda? I don't ever recall him naming anybody, no, sir. Do you recall him texting you on July the 4th, 2015, at age 22, and telling you that Lindy came by today, 30 minutes later, Amanda tells me she doesn't feel anything for me anymore? I don't, no sir. Do you recall um, the defendant texting you on July the 16th, of 2015, at 4.13 p.m., and saying, I'm pretty sure she is going to take Lindy with her to court to talk bad about me? I don't recall the conversation about that. Do you recall him texting you on July the 19th of 2015 at 12.17 a.m., a little bit after midnight, and, and saying it's total bullshit, 
she has those two bitches in her ear. They have never been through that shit. That was my conversation. No, that was, do you recall um, receiving a text from the defendant? No, sir. Um, do you know who he was referring to? Those um, two bitches. No, Lindy's the only one I ever knew. I didn't know him personally, but the only person I knew who talked to me about that was he was referencing. Uh, did you know an individual by the name of Rachel Hendricks? Not until that day. Did you, um, do you remember receiving a text from the defendant on July the 19th of 2015, same, the same day, just a little bit after that previous text, 12, 19 a.m., uh, saying, quote, Lindy feeds her full of shit? I don't know, sir. Do you remember, uh, going back to your deposition, Council, I refer you to page 39, lines 24 through 40, line 1. What are the lines? Uh, page 39, line 24 through page 40, line 1. And do you remember um, in your deposition testifying that I always knew he was upset with Lindy he didn't want her around because every time Lindy came around, Amanda would just be a different person. I do remember those conversations. On page 40, <coughs> starting at line 20, <coughs> you remember ever testifying in that same deposition, I think he was just worried about Lindy ruining his marriage and he thought she was breaking up their marriage by telling her she didn't have to deal with that kind of stuff. That really did remember that conversation. Do you recall in either a conversation or text messages um, the defendant um, calling um, Amanda Colley um, names. I do. Not personally, I don't recall. Do you remember getting a text from him on July the 26th of 2000? Objection, Your Honor, proper impeachment. Oh. Do you recall uh, um, the defendant sending you a text on July the 26th of 2015 at 8.53 p.m.? saying she's a whore. I don't, I mean, maybe, I don't, truthfully, I don't recall. Do you recall receiving a text from the defendant on August the 5th of 2015 at 11.40 p.m. stating she is an evil person? I, I can't say I do, sir. Do you receive, uh, remember, recall receiving two texts on August the 5th, 2015 at 11.42 and 11.43 p.m. First text, she's a cheating hire, um, and at 11.43 it was corrected for, she's a cheating whore. Do you remember receiving those texts? I don't, I don't recall much of those texts. It didn't really mean too much. much. Do you remember receiving a text from the defendant on August the 5th, 2015 at 11.50 p.m. stating, she is the worst person on this earth, exclamation point. Do you remember the defendant ever, either in verbal conversation or in text messages, um, indicating um, what he might do to Amanda? Never. Do you remember him receive, uh, sending you a text on July the 19th of 2015 at 12.22 a.m. stating, so I'm going to have to get nasty? Do not remember that, no sir. Do you remember rece uh, receiving a text from the defendant on August the 5th of 2015 at 11.56 p.m. stating, quote, now she will pay?
Yes, sir, one second. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Dickens. I'm sorry. Um, as far as the early morning hour, I guess four, around 4 o'clock on the 26th, when, uh, when uh, James showed up at your house, would you say he was more hurt than angry? Pretty much. He was, he was you know, seemed pretty, uh, pretty upset, but he was crying, you know. Because he just found those items sure. from his wife's yes, house? Yes, sir. Also, uh, you had stated that, uh, I believe you stated that he was <coughs> intoxicated, he wasn't drunk at that time? I didn't, I didn't catch that. He was not drunk or impaired at that time that you could not tell? That I, I mean, I pretty much know, you know, but from my visual, he, I didn't smell him like all along. He wasn't acting belligerent or anything. Like and then you stated that you thought uh, J.R. moved out shortly after uh, the July, July 4th, around that time frame? I think it was after the July, before or after July 4th. They were right around that holiday, I think so. Okay. Um, and then you also stated that you knew that there was an injunction in place against James, right? I did, yes, sir. Okay. Um, after, do you know about what time that was? I, I don't know, sir. All right, well, from, from it was all around that holiday. Okay. From the time that uh, James moved out, until August 26th, did you see James and Amanda and their children together? Um, several times. Yes. Several times? Yes. And was that at the marital residence? It was, yes. Sir. And when they were together, how would you describe their interaction? Judge, I'm going to object as to relevance. Oh. Can you repeat that, please? As to uh, their, how would you explain their interaction while they were together if you watched them? Uh, like, there was no problems. Did they appear to be happy? Uh, yes, sir. Did they appear to be a loving family? Uh, pretty much, yes, sir. <clears throat> did you, uh, during that time frame when, we, when you were together, did uh, your family and the Cowley family ever get together? I don't recall that. Okay. No, sir. All right. And also, did you at some point uh, become aware of uh, the impending divorce? Yes, sir. All right. And a lot of those text messages that uh, Mr. Johnson was asking you about, if you remember, um, would that, the time frame that he was telling you, would that have been after the uh, impending, the, the divorce was filed? I don't, I can't answer that question. I don't recall that. But you do remember him going through the divorce? Yes, sir. together as a family? I don't know the exact date, but it was it was within a I don't recall the exact date, but it was around Trey's birthday. And so if Trey was if Trey was born, you know, his birthday was August 26th, would it have been close to that Pretty time? That, seems that, uh, that sounds like the day before. Uh, and if if, uh, if you said you saw them together, were they together as a family unit then? All four of them were together, yes. Do you know if there was ever an issue with the air conditioning unit for the Cali residents? Um, there, there was. I just don't recall the date. It was, you know, it was after he had moved out. And as far as the yard, I object as to relevance. This line of question, Go ahead and ask your next question. The, the other, the other question has to do with um, the cutting of the grass. Did you used to cut the grass for the Cali's after Jr. moved out? I did. I took care of that property and several others in the cul de So when you uh, sent that picture of uh, what we now know to be Lamar cutting the grass, was it to stir the pot or was it to find out whether or not you needed to continue cutting the grass? It, it definitely was not to stir anything. It was to find out <clears throat> I was just about to go cut the grass. Didn't know if it was a landscape coming. Didn't know if it, my text, I think, I recall was I asked Rhonda if it was Lindy's husband. I've never met that gentleman. I don't know what it looks like. <clears throat> That's what the purpose of that text was. 
And then also, kind of to backtrack a little, when, uh, when you would see the Kali family together and after he moved out and after the injunction, what were, type, what were some of the activities that they were doing? Uh, hanging out in the backyard, playing. Um, the birthday one, I think. I think he had took a gift to him, and they were out back playing with that gift. And I was at the park. That's when I saw him with my two kids. I have nothing else to say. Any regrets, Mr. Jones? Yes, sir. I want to go back to my question. I think Mr. Oshuji <coughs> asked you about this too, and follow up my question um, regarding the defense demeanor in the early morning hours of August the 27th. Of 2015. I think the, the, the descriptions that you used here today was upset and crying. Um, I think that you were asked about whether he appeared to be angry. Um, so I'll ask you that question again. Did the defendant appear to be angry um, when he was talking to you on the early morning? As I remember stating, I think I said at one point he was irate, but then he was crying, he was upset. I mean, it was all running together. Okay. So I can't say he was whatever you just say. He was mad the whole time. Okay. Do you remember um, giving an interview with um, Detective English on August the 20th, the same day that all this happened, 27th, 2015? Yes, sir, in my, in my house. And um, when you were, she was asking you about his demeanor, you referred to him in that interview as angry, correct? I don't recall that. Can that person would be shown? asking you if he was angry and you said yes, is that correct? I uh, said so, yes, sir. And that, that's what you said that day, correct? That's what it must have been, yes, sir. I don't recall. Okay. No further. Any agree, Cross? <clears throat> is Mr. Dickens excused? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Dickens, you are excused. Thanks, sir. Dave, you have a short witness? We have a couple of short breaks this yes, Okay. Everybody clear. Right. Okay. I see a hand going up. I think it's your Okay. I'm good. Keep going. Okay. Let's keep going. I saw one else. Stay with Paul, uh, Robert Young. Remain standing. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and any other people? Yes. You can proceed it. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Um, excuse me. If you would introduce yourself to the jury and let them know how you're employed. Uh, public service assistant. My name is Robert Young. I work for the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been with St. John's uh, as a PSA, public service assistant? Four and a half years. And do you have prior law enforcement experience? I do. I'm retired from the New York State Police and spent 15 years with the Postal Inspector. And what are your duties as a PSA? And if they differ from a deputy, explain that to the jurors. <clears throat> We're, we do not, well, my job at this time, we uh, did initial investigations into non-suspect related crimes. Okay. And um, kind of take initial information and decide whether it needed, you could handle it or, or pass it on to a deputy? Is Correct. That? We would make the initial report. Uh -huh. And what type of crimes? Any kind of crimes? Non-suspect non, non -suspect related, but burglary, criminal mischief, identity theft. Okay. Were you working in that capacity back on August 27, 2015? I was. Did you have an occasion to respond to a burglary complaint that morning? I did. And do you know the address where you responded to? 260 Bellagio Drive. And the information you had, um, who was the complainant at that time? <clears throat> Originally it came in as a Lamar Doubley, but in fact it was a man. <laughs> and you know approximately when you uh, responded out to that area? I'm sorry? What time you uh, responded out to that area? Yeah, I arrived officially at 9.57. 9.57? Excuse me? Did you say 9.57? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you check your 956, phone? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. 
can you um, tell the jurors who was present when you responded? When I arrived at the front door, there was a gentleman who opened the door and did not introduce himself. He just pointed to the living room and said that she's over there. That the female was, in fact, um, Amanda Collin. The gentleman that opened the door was later identified to me as um, Lamar Dudley. Okay. And can you tell the jurors uh, what you observed about the house and just the demeanor of the female that you made? When, when I came into the living room, Mr. Dudley went off to the side to the kitchen, started doing dishes. I had no further contact with him. The house, there was a big TV, maybe a 50-inch TV had been smashed. You could see where it had burned. There was glass shattered on the floor. There was some clothes disarray. A couple items were just like on the couch where there would have been somewhere else. What was the demeanor of the female that you made, uh, Amanda? You could tell she had been crying. She was upset. She was holding. She had a small dog. She was holding. She came out of the bedroom and said, look, this is done. He did this. Um, and that's when, you know, I asked what was going on. Okay. Um, you said she said he did this, so did you find out that it was um, an identified suspect, not a non-suspect type I, I asked, Yes, I asked her, I said, well, would you explain to me what's going on? And she said, well, my that's husband did this. Did you say your the same. Without um, telling us um, what she said, I'm going to ask you, after you spoke with Ms. Uh, Colley, okay, uh, without telling us what she said, what did you do after you spoke with her? Um, after she explained the situation, I, I, to my aspect, it was no longer a burglary um, because it was a husband and wife. Um, I said that we needed a deputy for the domestic, and at that point, I said I asked her if she wanted one, and she said she'd think about it. I went outside, called the zone sergeant that was in charge of the ship and explained the situation. And um, did you ultimately decide to get someone out there right away or uh, not make that decision? When I went outside and called the sergeant, Amanda um, Collin came out. You didn't have an objection here, sir. Not for the truth. Good, thanks. It just came out. Go ahead. Answer your question now. We won't need judge came out and said she did not want to take any action at this time. She wanted to talk to her attorney and her mom. And I asked her two or three times, are you sure? And she was adamant that she did not want any action. She was to wait to speak to her mom and her attorney. Okay. So after um, hearing that, you didn't, you didn't take any further action at that time? After you, um, you shortly thereafter left the house? Correct. Okay. And did there come a time where you heard about um, a shooting in that same area after you left the home? Correct. I left Bellagio Drive and went up to Route 16, maybe two, three miles away, when the uh, call came on the radio that there was a shooting in the area. One And PSA Young, when you left the house that morning, um, were you aware that there was an injunction in place between the two? I was not. And um, did that have, the lack of that knowledge um, <clears throat> contribute to your, your belief there wasn't a burglary that morning that you Correct. said earlier? Yes. Okay. All right. Cross examination, Shane. No, Your Honor. Is Mr. Young excused? He is. Yes, you have your excuse. Thank you. How long do you want to go to your room? How long do you want to go to your room? I can do one in 15 minutes. 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Are you okay for 15 minutes? Okay. You see that thumbs up in the back. All right, let's go for 15 more minutes. Yes, sir. Who's your next one? Let's see, we call Detective McGinnis. Detective McGinnis, if you want to take the witness stand right here. <laughs> you remain standing when you get there. 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to be able to be the truth, the whole truth, and the whole truth? Yes, I do. You can be seated. Ms. Dudley Thank you. Deputy, would you please introduce yourself to the jury? Let them know how you're employed. Yes, I'm uh, Deputy Joseph McGinnis, Deputy Sheriff of the St. John's County Sheriff's Office for about 19 years now. Okay. And um, what are your current duties? Currently, I am assigned to the patrol unit in the northwest part of the county as a patrol deputy. And have you um, held other positions throughout your career at St. John's? Yes, I've worked as a patrol deputy, as a shift evidence technician, as a traffic unit, as a traffic homicide investigator, and a reconstructionist, a member of the bomb squad, and a detective of the major crimes unit. And what position were you in back in August of 2015? I was a detective with the major crime team. Were you asked at that time, uh, on or about August 27, 2015, <laughs> to uh, assist in the death investigation of homicide um, of Amanda Colley and Lindy Dawkins? Yes, yes, I was. And what did you do initially? Uh, initially, I responded to the Garrison Drive address, which was an address that came up during the investigation that was not the scene. Uh, my assignment at the time was to respond there, secure that address as a, as a place of interest, and to uh, interview family members of the alleged suspect of the time. Okay. And after you did that at that location, what were you asked to do next? Uh, I remained on the scene to keep the scene secure, and then uh, during the course of the investigation, it was learned that uh, Mr. Holly had gone to a nearby uh, gas station made some purchases, so I went to that gas station located on County Road 210 and obtained the surveillance video from the gas station. Okay. And when you responded to that, do you remember what gas station it was at the time? It was the Speedway, and it was located right at the entrance to the neighborhood. And when you went to that location, um, are you familiar with video surveillance systems? Yes, I am. Okay. And uh, how is it that you obtained that video? Uh, I spoke to the clerk that was working. Uh, she contacted her manager. I spoke to the manager on the phone, uh, explained who I was and what was going on. They gave me permission to access their video system, gave me the password to access their video system, at which point in time I, I <coughs> sat down at their computer station. I verified the timestamp on the computer station to make sure that uh, the timestamp correlated with the actual time, and then started to view the video. And um, the transaction you were looking for at that time centered on, on what time information did you have? Approximately 10, 11 a.m. And were you able to locate a transaction around that time? Yes, uh, through, the, through the video system that particular store had uh, quite a few cameras and so through the video system I was able to observe a vehicle, pull in, uh, the defendant get out of the vehicle, enter the store, uh, make a purchase, um, leave the store, get back in the vehicle, and leave. Okay. And um, when you reviewed that video, did you actually download that video yourself? I did. Okay. And uh, after uh, downloading that video and having it, uh, did you you indicate there's several video, uh, excuse me, camera uh, locations at that store? Is that correct? That's correct. What did you do uh, with that? Um, all the various cameras uh, in order to make a, a video that uh, kind of flowed a little more seamlessly. Um, once I collected all the video from the camera system, I uh, extracted individual video clips from the individual cameras and was able to uh, cut and splice them together into compilation that uh, allows the viewer to uh, watch Mr. Polly's movements throughout his transaction without having to go through the actual system and pull up each individual camera angle. And um, prior to court, did you have an opportunity to view that video um, and your compilation of video uh, and as we prepared it on a disc for court? You yes, said it. Your Honor, may I approach? You may. Show you what has been marked previously as state's OO for identification. If you could take a look at that, let me know if you recognize it. Yes, I do. Okay. And what do you recognize that to be? Uh, that is the disc that was prepared and my signature and date on it. And um, when we prepared this for court, those were the videos from the Speedway, 
store and your compilation video that you pre prepared yourself. Yes, the raw data plus the, uh, the compilation. Okay. Your Honor, this time I say you can move in state OO. Any objection? No objection, Your Honor. No objection. Should we receive the state's exhibit 42? We don't see times on this video. Uh, were the times uh, visible on the individual data clips that you have? Yes, the individual raw data has the timestamps on them. System. So as the clerk is bringing out the transaction, it displays what is being purchased. Okay. Uh, that also is kind of stripped out when you make the compilation note, is that correct? Correct. But it's on the raw data. It? It's on the raw data, yes.
Deputy, when, when you made this compilation video and you reviewed the raw data, uh, did you document in your report the state the times we've been talking about here today? Yes, sir. Do you know what time he arrived um, pulling into that pump? Uh, I refer to no, no. Yes, you may. Department notes at uh, 11, 10, 11 a.m. is when the vehicles first have seen uh, observed pulling in and pulling up to uh, the, the pumps. We um, <coughs> notated at the time where he is observed stepping out of the cashier line and going back to the beer cooler. Do you know what time that was? Uh, that would be 10, 13. Okay. And then um, with the uh, when you were able to review the receipt that popped up at the time and the product, what was it that he purchased? He purchased here. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> a single Corona extra 24 ounce can of beer and a pack of Marlboro cigarettes. Okay. And ultimately, what time um, does he walk out of the store and then leave the parking lot? Those last two times. He's Store at 10:14 and seeing the open parking lot at 10:16 a.m. Nothing further. Cross examination, Mr. Baker. Yes, Your Honor. Um, as far as the receipts that are the witness that he purchased, there was no gas on there. Uh, he did not purchase any gas at the register. At the register, so he. In order to pay for it, I guess, when he put the, the gas nozzle in the car, he would have paid for it at the pump. It appears so, yes. Like, did you ever check uh, the, those records to see what was purchased? I did not. Okay. One second. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else. Any redirect examination? No, you're wrong. That we want to get us excused. He is by the state. Your Honor, if we could just keep them under subpoena. If you're still under subpoena, you're subject to recall, but you are excused for now. Uh, you still can't talk about the case. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time to call the day. Uh, we will go ahead and uh, just a few moments uh, break for the day. Let me caution you during the weekend to please do not view, uh, listen to, uh, watch, or read any media accounts of the case. There will be media accounts of the police. Avoid that at all costs. Don't do any research in any type. Don't discuss this case with anybody uh, during the weekend. Uh, leave your notes here. They will be secured over the weekend uh, by the uh, bailiffs. And I do wish you a good weekend. We would like to have you back at 8.45 on Monday morning, same, same place, same time, same place, uh, at the injury lounge. And have a great weekend.